All right, welcome back. I'm going to do some more asks today, some more questions, see what we can get through here. So I'm just going to hop right in, okay, guys? The first one I have is this. I remember back in the good old days of season 5A where Beth fans were at our peak of hype. What's funny is I remember theories going around that Beth was going to have a, a fake-out death even back before Coda. A good few theorists thought the fake-out would be that she would fall or be pushed down the elevator shaft in the mid-season finale and assumed to have died in the fall or eaten by walkers. It's a weird blast from the past, but so funny that the theories were already happening before she was shot. Also, I finally found your theory directory. Turns out the phone app, on the phone app, you have to press the Tumblr description to see the link, and I've been enthralled. Lots of exciting readings to be had. I'm glad you finally found the, <laughs> the um, theory directory. Yeah, I know. Tumblr is finicky. It's just mostly very old, and I'm not throwing shade on it or anything, but I do wish that they would update it. It, it hasn't really kept up with the, with the times. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you found it on the phone. So, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, in terms of the theories, yeah. And, and the thing is, I I don't have a whole lot of experience with that because I wasn't really reading theories online until after Coda. I was a really um, dedicated fan in that I tuned in every week and I was definitely, you know, there in terms of Beth and Daryl. But um, I wasn't necessarily getting online and reading a lot of theories about that here and there, but not much. And it wasn't until after Coda that I got online and actually found TD and all of that. But in my, you know, research over the years and everything, I have read some, th there's one in particular that jumps to mind um, that was a pretty big blogger, you know, uh, in the fandom back at that time. And it was just her breakdown of Slab Town. So it was before Coda. It was, um, you know, in it, the the breakdown that I read that she did didn't say anything about, you know, Beth getting shot or a death fake out or anything. She was literally just breaking down the symbolism in Slab Town. And it was interesting because I read this, you know, probably a year or two after Coda. You know, I, I stumbled upon it and I found it. And everything that she found, all of the symbols that she pointed out in Slab Town, which I'm sure a lot of them are things that we've picked up on too and have talked about over the years. I don't remember in particular what she talked about, but just various symbols that she saw in Slab Town. And her conclusion is that all of the symbols in Slab Town were about resurrection and redemption and renewal. And she thought that was interesting because, you know, Slab Town, I mean, I mean even just the title, it's about death. It's about being amongst death and... So she was kind of going, I don't know where this is leading, but the symbols are very hopeful and it's about resurrection and redemption. And I just thought that was super interesting because it was before CODA happened and before anyone knew for sure what was going to happen in CODA, you know. Um, so yeah, just kind of to your point, that's kind of an experience I had that was similar to what you're talking about here, even though I wasn't really looking at um, theories online before CODA. So yeah, I mean... The great thing about TD is that, and, and I think this is really the difference between us and other fandoms and other shipping fandoms and things. Yeah, of course we ship Beth and Daryl and that's how we all came together, of course. But at the same time, our fandom was kind of always based on the symbolism. It was always based on what we were seeing and where we were seeing it go. And in a way, we fell in love with the ship even more so because of the symbolism. I mean, we would have loved it anyway, of course. But... The symbolism and the hope and, you know, the phoenix signs and the resurrection symbols around it just makes you love it even more than if those things weren't present. But um, anyway, <laughs> a little bit of a side tangent, but my point is we were always about symbols and, and trying to interpret the symbolism. So other shippers just like characters together and it's sort of something that they've made up and are hoping happens. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but it's not based on what's actually being put into the show. And so I, I actually really like that, that people were predicting her fake out even before it happened, even maybe before spoilers were leaked, because I know that there were some spoilers of CODA that were leaked um, beforehand, probably by the Spoiling Dead fan site. Um, but I just really like that because it just shows that we were always paying attention to the symbolism. We were always trying to interpret where they were going with it. And to some extent, we've always been right. <laughs> I mean, even though we didn't want to be right about that, they did give her a death fake out. And probably the people were um, predicting falling down the elevator shaft 
or something like that because it would have made the most sense for ease of bringing her back and ease of um, people in the audience being open to the fact that she wouldn't have actually died that way. And, you know, Gimple just went a lot bigger than that, a lot more intricate. He actually had her get shot in the head. And that, <laughs> I don't think anybody would have predicted that particular way of doing the death fake out because it's so extreme. And it is, that does make it harder for people to believe she could have survived it, you know? So anyway, very, very interesting. So thanks for sharing that with us. I, I really like that. And um, that's fun to know about. So thank you. Piano music in alone. Okay, yeah, I had to, um, I read through this one and I had to go do a little bit of research. So, so I've been wondering what music is on the piano in alone. Turns out I have the same book and I was able to match the blurry notes. It's Nocturne in E flat by Chopin. My paltry analysis skills have discovered that Chopin arrived in Paris 15, Mar or 15 October, age 21, and became a French citizen and died there October 17th. Huh, so is that of the same year? He was only there for two days? I don't know, I guess I, I didn't actually look that up. I'll have to look that up. Wikipedia tells us, um, Chopin composed his best known nocturne in E flat major, uh, opus nine, number two, when he was around 20 years old. This is, this well-known nocturne is in rounded binary form, A, A, B, A, B, A, uh, with coda C. It is 34 measures long and written in 12-8 meter, having a similar structure to a waltz. This melody is heard again three times during the piece. So definitely a lot of coincidences, at least with Paris and the coda. would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I, um, like I said, I didn't research Chopin as much, but I did look at the music and it's a very well-known classical piece. If you listen to it, you can you can listen to it on YouTube or something. You'll recognize it. It's it's pretty well known. But yeah, there's there's a few things there that we could point to. Um, obviously, the Paris thing, the the fact that he's French, as a French citizen, the ABA actually jumps out at me because we have the AB theme and the, like the A side, the B side, all of that. Obviously, yes, the coda. That's a big one. Um, the fact that there's a there's a rule of three in there. That's big. So one thing is I googled the name of the song and whether it had ever been used in TWD. So I think I literally put in, has Nocturne in E-flat major ever been used in The Walking Dead? And it actually did come up with something. I, it, it, unless the internet is missing it, which I doubt, it hasn't actually been seen, or I guess I should say heard, in the show. But it was used in one of the games, and if you if you Google that, it'll probably come up with a clip on YouTube um, where you can see the part of the game where you hear it. And it's something, it's, it says, um, it just says The Walking Dead game season four. I'm assuming that means back maybe when season four was airing. And it, I suppose in a way that makes sense because the music was seen in season four on the piano by Beth, and then they would have put it in the game at the same time. But it's the, the part of the game it's used on has to do with Clem. Now, I'm not a huge gamer. I don't know a lot about the games, but um, I should... I don't even know why I said that. I'm not a gamer at all. It's not that I'm not a huge gamer. I, I, I'm not a gamer. Um, but I have heard a lot of theories about Clem, and people have told me a lot about her parallels with Beth. Um, so it also, I guess, makes sense that the music would be played in the game around her when she has a lot of parallels to Beth, and that music was seen near Beth in the funeral home. Um, but it's still really interesting that they put it into the game, and in a way that sort of confirms all of the Beth Clem parallels because that music is in both places as a way to tie them together. So yeah, it's definitely really interesting. And I would love if we would hear this song somewhere in Daryl Dixon season two. I mean, we did hear classical music in the first season, quite a bit of it. And it would be great if we heard this somewhere. So yeah, I, I think this is really interesting. I don't know that I have ever seen anyone look into the, the music that's actually sitting on the piano. And that's obviously something we should have looked into. So that's great. But um, the other thing that I noticed is that it's very common because of the way that it sounds on the piano, the, the way the notes sound. People mix this song up with Claire de Lune. A lot of times people will say, oh, that song was at the end of this movie, and then they'll come back and go, oh, never mind, that was Claire de Lune, sorry. So the two of them get mixed up a lot because they sound very similar. And Claire de Lune was the main song that was used in the trailer for Daryl Dixon season one. So I thought that was interesting, too, how similar the song is to that one, and they use Claire de Lune for season one. I'm very, very curious to see the promotions for season two. We probably won't get them for another month or so, but um, 
I want to know like what song they're going to end up using in the trailer for season two. <laughs> it would be really awesome if it was this song. And if it was, it would just be more confirmation of Beth coming back around. So yeah, thank you for doing that. Um, uh, research for us. That was that was really interesting. Even when I, I, I mean, what I did looking at the music a little bit, it was like 10 minutes. It wasn't by any means a deep dive, but even what I found was super interesting. So that was really fun to go into. So thank you. Um, hi, not TD related, but what do you think about the theory that says Lizzie wasn't completely crazy? Some whisperers may have been at the fence at the prison and Lizzie heard them. So she thought all walkers were still kind of alive and that's what made her go crazy. I mean, I actually, I kind of love it. I kind of love that theory. I, I, I really am a fan of theories that tie everything together from the beginning of the series to the end. Um, but this is not even... So I could see it one of two ways. I could see this being true. I could see them saying this at some point, um, which would almost... It would definitely make it more tragic what happened to Lizzie because everyone thought she was just insane. And if she really wasn't, you know, I mean, that that, that makes it even more disturbing, everything that happened. Um and in a way, so, so I like that because it's it's even kind of a deeper level of things. On the other hand, I can also see that it was sort of a foreshadow, even if it wasn't literally that whispers were there at the time. It was a foreshadow of the whispers. And if that's the case, this is not even the first time we've had that. Uh, back in season three in Clear, when Rick and Michonne found Morgan, he was talking about things he was seeing, and he said people wearing dead people's faces. And everybody at the time thought, oh, the whispers, Morgan's been in contact with whispers. Was he really? I don't know. I mean, maybe. Maybe that's, he had seen something at some point, one of the whispers, and that stuck with him. Um, and, and Or maybe he hadn't seen anything like that, and it was just part of his delusion, because he really was in the thick of his delusion at that point, you know? So we don't know. And I, it's just one of those things we hope that at some point Gimple comes out and tells us what their intentions were at the time. But right now, it's, you know, it could be one or it could be the other, and we're kind of 50-50 on it. There's no way to know for sure. But I would love it if um, they come out and say, oh, yeah, every time we did that, it's because we wanted it to be that these characters came into contact maybe with the Whispers, but you couldn't prove it, and they didn't know what they were seeing, and, you know, since Morgan was having a rough time anyway, I mean, by the time he came out of that with Eastman and was a little bit more grounded, he probably, what you know, saying that hypothetically maybe he really did come into contact with the Whispers once he came out of that delusional state, he probably thought it was part of his delusion. He wouldn't have looked back at that and said, oh, but I really did see that. He would have just thought it was in his mind, you know, which makes it even more interesting because was, again, was he really in contact with them? But we don't know. So, like I said, I kind of love that theory. I think that <laughs> would be actually really cool if that was the case. But I, uh, you know, obviously we don't know exactly what their intentions were. So, once again, here's hoping that at some point <laughs> Gimple comes out and tells us exactly what they were going for, exactly what they were doing, exactly what they were planning, um, so that we know for sure. But we don't as of right now. So, thank you for the question. All right, I think we can do one more. I strongly believe AMC decided to postpone the release date till September because they knew that House of the Dragon would end up stealing all the attention or most of it because, let's be real, it has a much larger fan base than TWDU, and this season is a huge one, too. Yeah, I mean, that definitely could be. I, I don't know. I don't know that I entirely agree that it has a larger fan base. I think because they structure their show differently, um, they have more people watching all at the same time like uh, when the show is on because it's been, what has it been, a year or two since the first season and they have nothing in between. So their audience is very focused when the show is actually dropping new episodes, which is only for, what is it, eight or ten episodes? I haven't even started watching the season yet. So, I mean, when it's on, yeah, I think you're, you're right that it, their audience is very attentive and very focused on the episodes that are coming out and they're more likely to watch them now rather than waiting. Um, whereas TWD, they're still putting out more material every year, you know, in, in terms of the spinoffs, we usually don't go more than a handful of months, maybe six months without getting something new. And because of that, there's a lot of people who haven't even kept up on everything. They know that they can always go watch it. They can decide tomorrow to go watch The World Beyond or to get caught up on season one of Dead City, you know what I mean? So, um, because of that, the audience may be a little bit more scattered for TWD, but I still think TWD is one of the, if not the most demand show, on-demand show in the world. People are still watching it. They still have a massive audience. It's just a little bit more scattered. 
And I mean, don't get me wrong, House of the Dragon is definitely up there too. It's one of the big ones. So I, I could see it either way. I could see that they maybe went, well, because House of the Dragon is coming out this summer, let's just push it to fall, which was always the more coveted slot for T T W D anyway. So yeah, I, I think you I think you have a point, and I think you could be right. Um but it also could be other things. It could be production things. It could be that it just uh, worked better for them. You know, again, we don't really know. But that's a good point. That is a good point. And, you know, for those who watch both, you know, at least we have House of the Dragon right now uh, until we finally get back to our beloved Daryl Dixon. So, all right, guys, I'm going to call it there for the day. Um, I will be back next week, hopefully with a couple of episodes. And yeah, just kind of plugging along and waiting for fall to get here. So uh, please keep sending in your questions. I love to see what your thoughts are. And yeah, I will talk to you soon. Bye.